And then it's a great pleasure to um, introduce Sarah Billy from the University of Washington, giving the first talk of uh, the fall 2024 seminar on a journey from Schubert style rank functions via alternating sign matrices to quilts on posets. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, well, thanks so much for inviting me to this event. I think you guys are doing such wonderful work in keeping the Schubert community together. And I'm sorry that I, I'm on the West Coast, so I don't get to participate as often as I would like to, but um, I, I hope you'll keep it up. It's, it's really great. Um, I also wanted to use a moment, if I could, to advertise that I have um, been working really hard with Yibo Gao and Brendan Pawlowski on what I like to think of as uh, an, an extension of Bill Fulton's book in some sense, um, in the direction of filling in some of the more modern details about the flag manifold um, from various different perspectives that have happened since his beautiful book came out. And um, so we've titled this an introduction to the cohomology of the flag variety. It's uh, really just a, one chapter though of a beautiful book that's coming out called The Handbook of Combinatorial Algebraic Varieties or combinatorial algebraic geometry subvarieties of the flag variety. That's being edited by Eric Insko, Martha Precup, and Ed Richmond. And our chapter will be the introductory first chapter, but um, I have to put chapter in quotes because it's already 159 pages. So it got a little long. The editors know that it got a little long, but there was a lot to say. And um, we hope you all will um, take a look at this pretty soon. So I think it's coming tomorrow on my website. My class based on this chapter will start on Wednesday. So we're having a meeting tomorrow to clean up the last few things. And I think it'll be ready to put on the website. It's not quite ready to put on the archive though. So if so that there's some time for um, corrections this fall, but i um, happy to, I'd love to get comments from people. So just wanted you to know about that because this is the right audience for that um, chapter. Maybe you might also want to teach a topics class out of it. Okay, so um, this journey that I've been on from um, Fubini Bruja orders to quilts, uh, I wanted to tell you kind of a little bit of the story because the original part does connect better to the Schubert calculus business. So you probably have heard of Bruja orders. So I wanted to say how they extend to what we call the Fubini Bruja orders. And um, you may have heard of the Dedekin McNeil completion of a poset. That's how you get a lattice that contains it. Um, that's connected to the Bruja order and um, the alternating sign matrix play the right role in that in that part of the journey. And then we'll say how we got to these things we call quilts of alternating sign matrices, which is a vast generalization of the rank of a matrix. And, um, and then there are some properties of these quilts and the numerator of results that we've got so far, but there's really, it's a, it, I, we, um, Matthias and I think that we have opened up a lot of territory here and it'd be interesting and we hope you'll join us and look at some of the open problems. Oh, and just because I didn't say his name, this talk is based on joint work with Matthias Kondalenka from the University of Ljubljana. It was here on the top slide, but I went on to the chapter too quick. Okay, so the, all this is based on, on work with Matthias and also with Stark Ryan. I'm going to review some of those results. Okay, so... I wasn't quite sure how far back I should go, but just to make sure I don't scare anybody away for the coming year, let me start right away with Bruja order. Um, uh, if you have a permutation, let's say an SN, I'm gonna always denote it by the one line notation. So W will be a list of numbers W1 through WN in a particular order and um, each number has to appear exactly once. I use that square bracket N notation to mean set of numbers between one and N. And the history that hopefully you've seen some of um, based on this conference, this, this um, seminar's title, is that the Schubert varieties in the complete flag manifold are indexed by permutations. And they're defined by certain southwest rank conditions on matrices. And um, that's a very nice story. That's what's written up in part three of Fulton's Young Tableau book. And our new chapter is reviews that again, too. We're not expecting you to have read all of um, Young Tableau. But once you have these Schubert varieties, the Bruja order then is a natural partial order on permutations defined by um, V is less than or equal to W. If the corresponding Schubert variety, oh, there's a typo. It should be that 
um, a reverse inclusion. So V is less than W if XV is less than, is contained in X, oh, sorry. I want them to be reversed. So I want to have V is less than W if XW is less than or equal to XV. All right. Should I clarify that? Actually, could somebody just write it in the chat to get it right in case there's anybody who's a newbie who might not like that? That's a bad spot for a typo. But we'll get it fixed on the slides. Okay. So um, that's our partial order on permutations. There's a couple of different ways that you can describe it too. You don't have to know what a Schubert variety is to define this partial order on permutations. And um, one of the nice ways to describe it is in terms of something that's now being called the Gale order. At least I've seen a few notable people say it that way. So, um, and that's another typo actually, the K subsets of the numbers from one to N, and here's why I should have done it on the iPad. So um, the K subsets of the numbers from one to N is the partial order that you get by taking the two subsets ordering both of the sets in increasing order, and then compare smallest to smallest, second smallest to second smallest, and so on. So the first subset will be smaller than the second, if and only if each of the corresponding entries are smaller. So A1 is less than B1, A2 is less than B2, and so on. That's the Gale partial order. Gale was studying that in re regard to matroids in the 1960s. And um, this is a little bit of a misnomer because um, neither Gale nor Bruja invented the Bruja order on SN. This was actually studied by Erismond in 1934, where he characterized the um, containment order on Schubert varieties using this comparison of subsets. And the way that you do that is V is less than or equal to W in Bruja order, if and only if, when you take the first entry of V, it's less than or equal to the first entry of W. And if you take the first two entries of V combined and you sort them, they'll be less than or equal to the first two entries of W sorted. And then you compare the first three entries of V and W. And each time V is less than or equal to W as permutations, if and only if these sorted orders are all in comparison in the same direction. Okay, so you could start writing down Bruja order from that description and not even know what a Schubert variety is, right? That's a well-defined partial order. But another very natural way to describe Bruja order is in terms of the transitive closure of a set of some of the relations, and they are of the form um, a permutation W is less than or equal to what you get when you multiply on the left or the right by a transposition. You multiply W on the left or the right by a, by a transposition. It doesn't matter which side because either you're permuting, you're transposing numbers or you're transposing values, but either way it's a transposition. And the way that I wrote it, um, W is less than or equal to Tij times W, if and only if I is less than J and I appears to the left of J in W in one line notation. Okay, so that's a subset of the relations. And then the transitive closure means you have to take all of the things that you can get by a walk where you apply one transposition and then another transposition and another transposition each time you're going up. And each time you go up like this, you're increasing the number of inversions in the, um, in the one line notation. All right, and then there's um, another thing you could say, which is, okay, so that's some of the relations. We took the transitive closure, but was that the was that the minimal number of relations I needed to define this partial order, or could I get by with fewer of them? And the what people call the transitive reduction is sort of the minimal number of relations that you need. Those are the covering relations of a poset, and those are easy to characterize too. So W is less than Tijw, Will be a covering relation. So there's nothing else in between. Um, if and only if, when you apply that transposition switching i and j, you only increase the number of inversions by one, exactly one. So this will be a ranked post set. The rank function will be exactly the number of inversions. It's a, it's a nice post that has a lot of really lovely properties. Um, okay, so Lately, I've been studying these things called Fubini words, which maybe is not so familiar to you, or maybe you've seen it in another with other names, because it turns out there are lots of different names for the same thing in the literature. So now I'm also finding out that these are also called Cayley words, preferential arrangements, surjective words, packed words. Actually, I think um, Anders Cleason has a, a list of about 10 words now, 
But the reason that we're calling them the Fubini words is they're, um, they are objects that are counted by the Fubini numbers on the OEIS. And that's been established for a long time. This is actually sequence 670. That means it appeared really early on in Neil Sloan's collection. So what is a Fubini word then? Uh, it's a natural generalization of a permutation. It's just going to be a list of numbers, W1 through WN, in an ordered fashion, such that each of the numbers W1 through WN come from an alphabet, let's say 1 through K, and every single value between 1 and K has to appear at least once. So that's why it's kind of called a packed word, because they're all in there in some form, or a surjective word, because this would be exactly the same thing as W is a surjection from the numbers from 1 to N onto the numbers from 1 to K. Right. And um, I'll use the notation W sub N comma K to mean the set of all Fubini words which have N letters and the alphabet is one through K. So for example, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, that's a Fubini word. It's in W83, but one, 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 three, 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 seven would not be a Fubini word, right? Because there'd be some gaps in there. It's not packed. And a simple thing you can check is that every Fubini word represents a surjective map, like I just said, um, in one line notation. But that also means then you could think of it as an ordered set partition, which is a natural object too. So that's just what is the inverse image of the number one that goes into the first set? What is the inverse image of the number two that goes into the second set of the partition? What is the inverse image of three that goes into the third part of the partition and so on? So you could simply also refer to these as ordered set partitions if you like, but I wanna pay attention to them as words like one line notation. That's why I'm calling them Fubini words. Okay, so clearly the Fubini words generalize the set of permutations SN. It's just that the alphabet is one through N and the length is N, so WNN is SN. And um, so many of the, the properties of permutations carry over to these Fubini words, like inversions, right? You could ask for when, how many pairs are there where the bigger number, a number that's strictly bigger appears to the left of a, a smaller number. Or you could ask for descents, or you could even ask for something like the permutation matrices. So let me write that out because we'll kind of be thinking about matrices. So um, if you're given a Fubini word W1 through WN, let's make the corresponding matrix be M sub W. It'll be a K by N matrix. So uh, the smaller number is the number of rows and it has more columns. And you'll put a one in entry W sub J comma J for every, for every column. So every column gets a one, but every row might have, it has at least one one because it's a Fubini word, but it might have more than one. Okay, so for example, with our Fubini word two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, you could probably figure out the number of inversions. Maybe you already did. Uh, I counted 10 inversions. I see three descents and the corresponding matrix uh, should look as you expect. Agreed? Pipe up with any questions, of course, especially if we're gonna take a little break. I think we have time to answer any questions. Okay, so just like a permutation matrix, right? Great. So, um, well, what sort of poset theory could go with this WNK object with these Fubini words? Well, you certainly would look to SN for motivation to study these things, right? So you could think about um, the Bruja order that we already talked about as the transitive closure of the permutation W less than WTIJs. Or, um, Or we could look at a, a relative of that, a sub poset of Bruja order called the weak order. And that's what you get when you just do one adjacent transposition at a time. So um, if you only use the adjacent transpositions when T i comma i plus one are being switched, um, that's just a subset of all the relations we had for Bruja order. So it's certainly sitting in there and it's on all of the permutations. So it's on the same set of elements, but it just has fewer fewer edges. And people use that a lot, like that comes up with about Samosin varieties. So, um, 
Okay, so we have these post sets. We can use them as motivation. And the key idea here to study Fubini words would be to find some geometry that goes with it from this point of view. So what is the right geometry? And this was handed to us on a, on a silver platter by Brendan Palowski and Brendan Rhodes. I call them Brendan and Brendan because they do spell their names differently. Um, so um, they say, let X, N, K be the space of all spanning line configurations, where you take N lines going through the origin, sitting inside of complex K dimensional space. Um, so there's an example of how I think about them with it's kind of like a pin cushion of lines going through the or origin, but of course in complex space and can be much higher than three dimensional. Um, and then anytime you have a spanning line configuration, how would I send you email telling you which one I'm thinking about? I would put it in terms of a K by N matrix, right? Where each of the columns of the matrix are giving me a vector, which is indicating some one of the, one of the lines in this configuration. It'll be a spanning line configuration. It has to be spanning. So it ha this matrix would have to be a full rank and each of the vectors have to be non-zero, so they really do represent a line and not just the origin. So all of the columns are gonna be always um, non-zero. And just to make it so that I'm giving you, a, um, you know, something in somewhat of a canonical form, I might as well rescale every column so that there's at least one one, because that won't change the line that, that vector indicates. Okay, so let's have a little bit of notation. F, N, K is the set of full rank K by N matrices with no zero columns. And T, B, the diagonal matrix, diagonal matrices in GLN as usual. And then um, Palowski Rhodes pointed out that this spanning line configuration X, N, K is a smooth, complex manifold. It's got an open embedding into a product of projective spaces. It's actually not compact, so it has some trickiness that comes up in the geometry, but uh, it has many nice properties. And a couple simple cases to think about. If you think about x n comma one, so you have a one by n matrix, you're allowed to rescale every column. So some entry is one. So the only thing that could be in there is one, 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 one. So it's a one point space. And on the other end of the spectrum, um, x n comma n, that's like gln mod the torus. Um, that is, projects easily onto the flag manifold, GLN mod B, upper triangular matrices is the B there. And um, this map is a homotopy equivalent, homotopy equivalent, so it has nice properties, it preserves cohomology ring among thing, other things. And um, the um, Palowski roads made a lot of really important observations with um, the spanning line configuration. So the first one is that what is the cohomology ring of X and K in general for an arbitrary N bigger than or equal to K? It turns out this is a variation on the covariant algebra. So it'll be the polynomial ring with N variables and you mod out by some of the elementary symmetric functions, the ones indexed by the last few um, subscripts. So here elementary um, symmetric functions, this is just like the sum over all subsets of the variables of a particular size. And then you take xi1 times xi2 times xi3, et cetera. And then you also mod out by the, all of the powers of the variables, the kth powers of the variables for this ring. And this was the original motivation of Palowski Rhodes to look at spending line configuration. They, Haglin Rhodes and Shimizono had already um, been studying this particular variation on the cohomology ring. And they have shown it has lots of nice properties and connections to the delta conjecture, which has now been solved in McDonald theory. Uh, nice properties. And um, Brendan Rhodes was asking, okay, so we had this nice ring. Is it the cohomology of something? And so that's how they got their way to the spending line configurations. And a nice theorem in this Palowski Rhodes paper is. Um, connected to the SN representation theory of RNK. So you probably know that the covariant algebra um, is affords the regular representation under SN. Uh, in this case, you have something similar. So 
you can think about the SN action permuting the variables on RNK. And what kind of, uh, how does that decompose into irreducibles? Well, interestingly, it's isomorphic to the cohomology ring of XNK, which happens to have an SN action on it too, and it's exactly the same. So that's the same um, isomorphic module. Anyway. So I think that's a lovely theorem. Now, okay, so in their work, they started looking at finding, first of all, a canonical representation of every spanning line configuration. Mm -hmm. We have some choices right now about which entries are we going to rescale to be one. So let's pin that down so we have a canonical representation. And um, one way that you could do it is just like with super varieties, you start with any old matrix, non-zero columns, right, and of full rank. Then I could always start doing Gauss elimination by rows, right? Just elementary row operations, whatever is in the first column, there's something non-zero in the first column, rescale that first thing, highest thing to be one, and use it to clear out the rest of the column. And then in the next column, find the highest thing that's non-zero. And if that's in a different row, rescale it to be one, and use it to clear below. But if that happens to be in the same row as what you used on the previous step, just skip that one for the minute and go to the next non-zero thing. Unless there is none, in which case you have no choice, rescale the one entry to be one. Okay, so you go through this process. And of course, along the way, there are gonna be some columns that end up with these pivot ones, but some columns like in this case, column three, um, I've already got pivot ones in column one and two, and those are the only non-zero entries in column three. So I can't really rescale something to be one and and clear out below again without messing up those columns that I've already done. So we have to figure out what we want to do here. And this is where you have some choices. And Palowski Road say, okay, if the star at the top is not zero, then we would use that one to rescale it to be one, and we'll leave this second star below as it is. And this is a way of associating a Fubini word to this matrix. So in this case, if all of the stars were non-zero, I would associate to this one, 411.25313. And I put down here the specifics if you're interested. Let me just run through it. You don't need to know these details to carry on with the rest. But the idea is it's a concrete algorithm. Um, you look at the the spans of the initial columns. The initial columns are the ones that we have those pivot ones. And so in this case, um, so I have I have a question. In in your example, all the ones happen to be the bottom non-zero entry in the column, but I think that's a coincidence. Uh, no, that's not a coincidence because once I get that pivot one, I'm going to use it to cancel out everything below it. Okay, that, that gives you a different line. What do you mean it gives you a different line? I thought the columns spanned all the different lines in the... Ah, uh, so yes, 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 yes. I, you're right. When you do this, you change your spanning line configuration. Maybe you're kind of trying to make it a little more orthogonal. But in the end, we're going to remember that all possible lower triangular actions with ones down the diagonal will also give you valid um, spanning line configurations. And we're kind of trying to separate that factor from this other part of the factor. OK, OK, thanks. Yeah, good point. Good point. I didn't mean that for that to be confusing. Okay, so um, alpha of W is gonna be a list of numbers, which is where these initial, where the pivot ones are. Alpha one is uh, the column containing the first non-zero thing in row one. Alpha two is the column where the first non-zero thing happens in row two and so on. Um, since this matrix is full rank, there will be something in row two. There will be something non-zero in row three. There will be something non-zero in every row. So this will work out to have pivots in every, a pivot in every row. So in this case, the alpha vector would be two, four, six, one, five. And um, there's also a corresponding permutation in um, SK that goes with this kind of a somewhat partially factored form here. Um, the permutation matrix is just what happens when you pay attention only to the pivot ones. 
So in this case, that would be four, one, two, five, three. That's the initial permutation. And then we uh, they call that permutation pi of w. And then um, which entry are you gonna scale to be one and which how is that gonna relate to this Fubini word? We're gonna say the Fubini, the jth entry of the Fubini word wj is equal to pi sub h if the row pi sub h comma j does not equal zero. So that means in column j, you have something not zero in row h and for all of the elements in the initial permutation, which are further to the right than pi h, we must have a zero. So it, it, in column two, we're gonna label that one because as I look backwards, I have something in row one, one and I couldn't get away with just the span of the first column alone. Something like, it takes a little bit of practice with it, but anyway, it's well-defined algorithm. How do you get this Fubini word out of it? Okay, so um, what we're trying to get to here is the definition that Pawlowski Rhodes gave of the pattern matrix P sub W for a Fubini word. And it is this K by N matrix obtained after you do the row reduction of the matrix where you change each of the stars in position W, J, comma, J to be one for each J that is not one of the initial words. And then you, one of the, sorry, one of the initial columns. And so that's the one that we're gonna rescale to be non-zero. And so this, it, I put here now um, actual stars instead of asterisks to say these are a little bit different. Um, now the pattern matrix, the ones are filled in in exactly the same places as the, like the permutation matrix for the Fubini word. And these stars now are allowed to be any complex number. So they index some sort of cell in the full dimensional, full, um, full rank K by N matrices. So here's an example. I'm gonna use the pattern matrix both I'm going to abuse notation, abuse the word a little bit. It is both a matrix with one zeros and stars. And I'm also going to use it as the set of all possible ways that I could fill in those stars with complex numbers. I hope that's okay for, for you as we, as we need it. So the matrix here <clears throat> with a, some complex entries and some negative entries, this sits inside the set of all matrices you can get from the pattern matrix of 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1. Well, the one above is the pattern matrix. Okay, so now, okay, how do we get them all? Now? How do we get all of the K, the spanning line configurations in X and K? So let's let U sub K be the K by K lower triangular matrices with ones along the diagonal. And these, if I multiply on the left by one of these to a matrix, it has the ability to kind of smear, take any row and add any multiple to a lower row of it, right? So the theorem is that every spanning line configuration in X and K can be represented uniquely by a matrix of the coming from a lower triangular matrix with ones on the diagonal times something in a pattern matrix for some Fubini word W in W and K. So that's a factorization. And it's nice because once you have a canonical form, you know, we needed that, we use that all the time in Schubert variety land too, that we have a nice canonical form related to the diagram of the permutation. So this plays the same role. And then um, with this decomposition, and this is kind of like the Bruja decomposition, but it's very efficient, right? Everything is represented uniquely this way. Um, every one of these sets, UK times PW, taking all the matrices in UK times all the matrices that have that same um, pattern matrix style, that will be a cell, it's got some dimension. It's gonna be number of stars in PW times the number of free entries in UK. So that would be K choose two. It represents a cell in the spanning line configurations X and K. So its dimension is K choose two plus the number of stars in, in PW. And these are the sets that we wanna pay attention to. This is like the analog of the Schubert cells. So let's let C sub W be the set of matrices UK times PW and the spanning line configurations that go with them as points. And we'll call that C sub W, we'll call it a PR cell standing for Pawlowski Rhodes cell, since they're the first ones to look at this. And the closure of those cells, that'll 
I'll denote that by C sub W bar. Um, and you take the closure there again in the Zariski topology on the spanning line configurations and you have embedded that, let's say, into the projective space P to the, um, K minus one to the nth power. Those will be our PR varieties. I hope somebody's watching the chat for me. If there's anything I should answer, definitely interrupt. Okay, so those are our PR varieties, PR cells, that just exact analogy of the Schubert cells and Schubert varieties. Hopefully we're back on familiar territory even though those pattern matrices are maybe slightly hard to define, that's the only wrinkle in this so far. Okay, so what's, what can we say about these varieties? Well, certainly the cells, C sub W, is gonna be determined by spans and rank conditions on subsets of rows and columns and matrices. That comes right out of the, the definitions of where they came from. And so the ideal defining a PR variety it's going to come from those rank conditions. So once again, it's going to be generated by determinantal minors that vanish. Any minor that vanishes on C sub W um, will, will vanish on the closure too. So it's something like that. All right. And um, nice properties here. There is actually a total order on the Fubini words corresponding to these PR cells and varieties that give rise to a paving by affines of the spanning line configurations. And that means then somewhat automatically in that theory that the cohomology classes for the PR varieties do, um, they, they give you a basis for the cohomology ring and they can be represented by a variation of Schubert polynomials actually. And um, these polynomials descend to a basis down in the analog of the covariant algebra R and K over Z. So you can actually write them out and believe it or not, it ends up being regular old Schubert polynomials, but where you've permuted the variables a little bit, depending on K and the particular W that you're talking about. So they're very familiar objects in some sense to our audience. And the Poincaré polynomial for the cohomology ring for the spanning line configurations is a nice analog of the Q analog of N factorial. That would mean if I took the sum over every single Pawlowski road cell and I write down Q to the co-dimension of the corresponding variety, let's do it that way, then this is um, a Q analog of the number of ordered set partitions. And it's just the Q analog of K factorial times the reverse of the starting numbers of the second kind Qified. Question? Yeah, sure. On the previous slide, um there was uh, uh, the observation. Um, so this is one of those good cases where the closure is defined by you replace your rank equation by a rank inequality. Yes, yes. And the rank equations that you put in are not, they're similar to the super variety ones, but um, <clears throat> so what they're gonna say is that the top so many rows and this set of columns has a particular rank and the, another subset of rows and this set of columns has a particular rank. And so you can work that out. But any minor that does vanish on C sub W will vanish on the closure and, and that is how you might start getting such equations. Well, that's my question, whether if you take those, so yes, those are so some, some equations that hold on the closure, but if you just impose those equations, um, do you definitely get the closure and not union junk? You don't get any junk in this case from the point of view of the spanning line configurations. You would you get some weird things if you work with the, you know, the matrix version of it, K by N matrices. But I am assuming here that you have non-zero columns and full rank. Yeah. So what I wondered about, do you get a reduced ideal that, that seems like that should be a theorem then if that's true sure i think you automatically get a reduced ideal here but um but there are other ideals that also carve out this set in terms of x and k and that's actually some work that um stark ryan and i did so there is something to be worked out here a little bit better in terms of what are the difference between these two um ideals if you were to work on x uh K by N matrices. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that sounds surprising if uh, if that happens automatically. Yeah. yeah. We have okay. some interesting 
yeah, had to do some real work to do that. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to stick with the idea with the post heads. So let me come back to this. So the, the natural analog of Bruja order here would be you write down a partial order where two Fubini words are related, if and only if you have the corresponding reverse containment of PR varieties. So here I got it right. V is less than or equal to W if and only if CV is con contains C sub W. Then we're going to call that the medium roast Fubini Bruja order. My collaborator, Stark Ryan, picked this name. Um, Seattle has a lot of coffee drinkers, so this seemed to go along with it. And it implies that we also have a couple other coffee-related partial orders coming up that are also natural. But this is the one that I think most obviously generalizes Bruja order in my mind. So um, it, it has the property that it does respect co-dimension. So V is less than W if and only if the co-dimension of V is strictly less than the co-dimension of W. Um, it's not a ranked post set. It, it is for very small values of N and K, but already for um, N equals five, K equals four, it's not. Um, and it has a funny thing that Schubert varieties doesn't have. And that is if you take one of these PR varieties, C sub V, it's a closure, right? It contains points outside of just CV. It can actually contain a point in another cell, even though it doesn't contain the whole cell. So that's possible, right? Okay. Um, but this leads us to consider another partial order. And this was already considered by Pawlowski Rhodes. Um, they they said, here, let's make a relation on Fubini words. Let's say V arrows W if the closure of CV contains some point in CW. And they pointed out, they proved actually that this relation, the, the graph that you get there is acyclic. So it gives rise under transitive closure to some other poset. And it's going to be different. It'll contain the medium roast Fubini order because, of course, if you if one closure contains the other closure, this you'd have V touches W, but it's not always true. So this gives rise to another poset, which has more edges in it, but on the same set of elements. So Stark likes to call that the espresso Fubini, espresso roast Fubini Bruja order, because it's stronger, it has more edges. And um, in some sense, it looks like this, the cells, instead of aligning nicely on faces, they kind of are like a bunch of badly stacked cubes and they can touch each other in small places. Um, when they do, they do a nice thing and they, they would at least touch on those, those analogs of the permutation matrices. So it's not so hard to test when that happens. But here's a couple other nice things that come out of this. Um, the analog of the transposition rule for Bruja order is pretty easy. So if V is equal to Tij times W, um, here Tij would transpose two rows kind of thing. And that would, you'd think of that as transposing two values in a Fubini word, like you take all the ones and switch them for all the twos maybe. So if T equals T I J W and that initial permutation pi W covers pi V in Bruja order, then actually W covers V in the espresso and the medium roast order and the dimension goes up by one. So that one's a really nice easy one. Another nice covering relation is what we like to call the pushback rule. It also changes the dimension by exactly one, so we know for sure it's a covering relation. So let's say you have a Fubini word W1 through WN, and you have some redundant letter. That means it's not the initial time that a letter has appeared. So let's say WJ is equal to pi I in particular to relate it back to the initial permutation. Well, then you go to that letter, and if you change pi I to be pi I plus one, the one that comes after, that that's going to give rise to um, an edge in the espresso roast, and it will um, it will increase dimension by one. So, okay, so here's an example of that push obser observation. Um, you take W to be two one two three, and V to be two one one three. So the Two one two three has a redundant two in the third position, so I can take that two and I can push it back in terms of the initial permutation. Now, can you see what the initial permutation is? The initial permutation for W is two one three because if I just read the first time, the two 
appears, the first time the one appears, the first time the three appears. So I'm pushing the I'm pushing a two to be a one. That's how we get this other pattern matrix. It's relatively straightforward. So those are some of the covering relations that appear. And um, you can use this actually to get um, another partial order. So it'll be called the decaf partial order, decaf Pubini par Bruja partial order. Um, that's going to be the product of two partial orders, one of which is just our old friend Bruja order on the symmetric group, but of size k, the, the permutations of length k. And then you multiply that by the pushback rule applied to only Fubini words where the initial permutation is one, two, three of decay. And the product of those two posets is a subposet of medium roast. It's also a subposet of the um, espresso roast. And it's nicer. It's a lot nicer. It is ranked. It's a ranked poset. It's ranked by co-dimension. It has a nice, it has the same rank generating function as the Poincaré polynomials for the spanning line configurations. So, you know, we at least with that one, we gave you everything. We gave you the whole, as well as we understand Bruja order, we understand these. Okay, so here's some, just briefly, let me mention a couple of these theorems, um, but I see I'm running a little low on time already. Am I supposed to quit and then come back or am I supposed to quit at 2.30? Yeah, we usually have a we usually have a small break at at some point. It, it might be we should just have a very small break today, maybe two minutes instead of five. Okay, okay right. can we do that now? Here, I'm going to put this back. Uh, what I want you to know at the end of the day is what's the medium roast Fubini order. So there it is. Let's take a two minute break. Okay, let's look at the medium roast for two minutes. Thanks. <clears throat>